All right, Jonathan, we yeah. have a guest host today, Mr. Sam, Samuel. Samuel and I go a few years back. We used to work together. Thank you for joining us, Samuel. Oh, thank you. And, um, nice seeing you again. Yeah, yeah, it's great to see you. And um, yeah, so we're going to talk about tech birthdays. So we'll let you kick it off, Jonathan. All right. We'll start off with Jay Alderson, or Al Adelson, who's known for Revision 3 who was born on September 7th. Man, this guy, this guy is our age, Sam. I know. Is that, is that good or bad? <laughs> well, I mean, he, he did something. <laughs> <laughs> I've never really heard of this guy. He was born in Detroit. I lived in Detroit for a while. I'll tell you something, Detroit in the 80s was the worst. <laughs> well he went to boston university oh wow did you didn't go to boston did you no i had a lot of friends that went there but and computer science wasn't his main thing it was just a concentration he hmm. studied uh film and broadcasting that's interesting what is what is a concentration in computer science what is that it's mean? like a minor i think oh interesting maybe it's less than a minor just like a little bit classes here and there like if this film and broadcasting doesn't work out <laughs> computer science yeah. oh man he okay so after the experience at equinix and stress and stress is associate and his work in the government cybersecurity following 9 11 Adelson moved to pauling new york so he went from San Rafael to Pauling, New York, commuted from New York to San Francisco. That's a hell of a commute. That's a longer commute than what I have right now. Wow. But that's an example of somebody, um, like generally people tend to, when they go from the East Coast to the West Coast, they don't go back, mostly because of the weather, I think. But um, he must have found something good if it brought him back to New York. So apparently he's like, since 2003, he's been with the United States House Homeland Security Subcommittee on Emerging Threats, Cybersecurity, and Science and Technology, part of the panel for the private sector role in keeping America cyberspace secure. So this film and broadcasting major who concentrated in computer science is a security expert for Homeland Security. And that's job security, no pun intended, <laughs> um, <laughs> considering the rise of cyber criminals, ransomware and stuff like that. Um, that's, that's a big industry to be in right now is cybersecurity. So if you, if you take computer science as a concentration, which is, Jonathan, you said less than a minor? I, think, I, I feel like it would be because like it doesn't have like a title or anything. Yeah. And I mean, this is kind of a person who studied film and broadcasting and then just said, hey, I'm just going to go to the government and tell them that I'm familiar with cybersecurity and pick up a contract and have them fly me back and forth between New York and San Francisco. Nice. Is, is that? That's an impression I get. I wonder how he decided to do that too. Just like <laughs> apparently it was after 9 11. 9 11 just kind of changed the world, and film and broadcasting experts got into cybersecurity. But you know what? Actually, there is, there is a thing between film and broadcasting and security because there's a lot of piracy and, um, with, uh, with movies. And so when you're trying to protect your, your intellectual property, when that, you know, things that you film and things, stuff like that, you have to learn about security in order to avoid it from getting out to the internet. And if it does get out to the internet, you want to be able to put some type of signature on those That's files true. to identify who this, the, who leaked this, you know, what, what source leaked this. 
So yeah, I can I can totally see the um, the connection with security on this thing. Cool. I mean, we started out making fun of the guy, but it turned out to be something legitimate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Jay? Well, that's that's Jay. All right. Next up, we have David Packard, who's known for HP. Interesting. Part of the P and Hewlett Packard. He's the P and HP. Wow. You just didn't go there, Jonathan, did you? <laughs> Packard served as president of the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences from 1976 till I was five years old. He was a member of the Trilateral Commission. Wow. I haven't heard about that in a while. The Trilateral Commission, that was the, geez, I don't even remember. Only got the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1988. So wait a second. He's an electrical engineer. Didn't you study electrical engineer, Sam? Well. <laughs> it didn't that's... quite work out that way, did it? No. Okay. We'll get to that story later. <laughs> I, I still don't fully know what electrical engineering is. Oh. <laughs> I'm sure we could probably look it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> so he was president of Hewlett Packard from 64, serving as president. Wow, Hewlett Packard was founded in 1939. What the heck did they do in 1939? I just know them for printers and computers. That's interesting. Um, I know in high school, they had a graphing calculator. So I think they, they were into electronics of some form. Interesting. So from 47 to 64, and then he was CEO for um, 64 to 68. And then he served as chairman of the board from 64 to 68 and 72 through 93. And then he also served as the U.S. De Deputy Secretary of Defense from 69 to 71 during the Nixon administration. The plot thickens. <laughs> oh, boy. This is interesting. Um, Packard also served as president of the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences, USU, from 76 to 81. This guy's a... He's been a lot of things, huh? Yeah, pretty smart guy. No, you know what? Sam, tell me if you agree with me. People do not get to be in these positions because they're smart. They get to be in these positions because they, they can deal with people's attitudes. I think that would help, especially... <laughs> Um, being the Secretary of Defense, um, because when you're at that level in government, there's a lot of um, politics and dealing with all that that nonsense. I mean, we see it today in in um, Trump's cabinet when when he was around, and you know, if you're not able to deal with people, like you were gone. But yeah. uh, today is a little bit different because back then is. It was about dealing with people and, and work getting, you know, working well with others. In Trump's cabinet, it was more um, always saying yes and stepping back and not asking questions. <laughs> oh, times have changed. Oh, my goodness. All right. What All right. Got, Jonathan. Next up, we have Dennis Ritchie. This is one of my favorites. Hey, you know who Dennis familiar. You know who he is, right, Sam? Oh, he, he, yeah, he he's one of the, he created the C language. Yes. Him, him along with Ken Thompson. Hey, there's a B programming language? What is that? <laughs> That's there's, interesting. There's even, there's even A, or was it called Algo? Is that what's considered the A language? Algo? And then... Then came B, and then they, they settled at C or something like that. I 
geez, that's too old for me. I mean, these languages. Um, so, so these, so Dennis Ritchie was working at Bell Labs, and and here's here's a story that I know. That tell me if you if you've heard the same story, Sam. These guys worked at Bell Labs, and they needed a way to abstract the machine language from the Unix operating system, because I guess moving from one version of Unix to the next or moving from, from one hardware to the next was causing them to have to reprogram a lot of their programs. Yeah, from so, scratch. Correct. So by abstracting the machine language to C, uh, this would allow them to run the same C program or compile the same C program across different versions of Unix and across different sets of hardware without having to rewrite the program, but just having to create a new compiler that was specific for the hardware that was being used. That's right. So you would have this, you had the same source code and you would have to compile it for different hardwares, um, which means you didn't have to rewrite code, which was nice. Yeah, yeah. And you just have to create it. And um, you know who else worked at Bell Labs and probably still works there? is Bajoran Strauss Troop. He was no. the founder of C++. He doesn't work there anymore. You know where he works now? No. He works for Google and he's the one that created the Go language. Are you kidding me? I am not kidding you. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in our main segment, okay? <laughs> wow.
All right, Jonathan, we have a guest host this time around to help us out with tech history. Welcome aboard, Sam. Thank you. Glad to be here. Sweet. Kick it off, Jonathan. All right. Tech history starting on September 6th. We have Google Satellite GOI 1 launched. What is this all about? Have you heard about this, Sam? Mm. No, I've heard about the Tesla satellites. GI is capable of taking high. Oh, is it what it used for um, Google Maps for satellite oh, view? Oh, yeah, yeah. High resolution Earth satellite. It's interesting that the highest resolution the government has restricted for its own use. So what we're seeing is not actually the highest resolution, apparently. And also, I'm sure um, certain countries like North Korea, um, they don't want to have their picture taken. <laughs> so, so wow, look at the images. This thing can give you details down to 16 inches. So it takes details up to 16 inches from the surface. Wow. Commercial usage is limited to down to 20 inches. Now with Google, I think it's uh, three meters, right? That's the lowest you can go. I don't know. I think so. I think three meters is, a, is the lowest you can go. Like it, it's kind of like, like the, or is it 10 meters? It might be 10 meters. It's kind of like the 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 height limit of a of what a drone would fly at, hmm. and so they yeah they don't they don't want to give you the the sixteen inch detail or the twenty inch detail. They only give you like ten meters from the sky. But this is cool. This is what's being used for uh, Google Maps. That's cool. Bing launched their thing. I always thought that the Bing Maps was a little bit clearer than the the Google one. So Bing has something similar. They have the um, they have their own satellite view on Bing Maps. They also have the what they call a helicopter view. Oh, interesting. Uh, I, I'm assuming that Microsoft has their own uh, satellite for doing that. There's a ton of satellites up in the in the atmosphere, right? There is not only a ton. There's also um, uh, a huge amount of space junk that they have to track. Um, and it's been building up over the years as astronauts worked on satellites or on the space station and they let a few uh, uh, bolts just float away. Um, they didn't know at the time they're creating space junk and those bolts are gonna stay in orbit for possibly tens of thousands of years traveling at 5,000 miles per hour and endangering wow. other um, satellites or people who have to go up there. And we're talking about low Earth orbit that most of this junk is in. Huh. That's interesting. So this GOI-1 eventually is going to become part of that space junk? A lot of satellites that go into space now, um, they have a decommission plan to where they can slow themselves down enough so that they'll eventually crash back down to earth um, and kill a cow. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, some of the bigger pieces they have to worry about, but for the most part, satellites tend to just break up into some, so many small pieces that and usually never makes it to the ground um, uh, because they're still traveling at like 4,000 miles per hour when they enter the atmosphere. So they're just like vaporized. Yeah, yeah. Um, but stuff like... Um, uh, China just had something recently that they tried to get into space. It didn't work out and it crash landed, I think, in the Indian Ocean. But it was pretty big. Yeah. And that one didn't make it into space. And all the countries sounded the alarms like, hey, where's this thing going to land? <laughs> yeah, and China's yeah. like, don't worry, we got it under control. <laughs> I, the reason I threw out the kill a cow thing, because remember um, when, we, when we had Jeff on the, uh, on the show, Jonathan? We had the same thing. We had some um, a satellite crash, 
and some of the debris landed within a country. I think it was Italy or France or something like that. And luckily, the debris only killed one cow. It didn't kill. There wasn't any human casualties, but one cow did get killed. And I think uh, I think Jeff made a comment said that must have made some good burgers. <laughs> oh, well, it's honest. It wasn't a cow in India that got killed because that would have that would have raised some eyebrows, huh? Might have become an international incident. <laughs> cool. All That's right, we got stuff. On September 7th, the iPod Nano introduced. Oh my gosh. I remember this one. I, had I remember one. The, the first one, the, the original iPad, uh, iPod, it, um, it, was it a didn't bright. have flash memory. It had actually a, a very tiny hard drive that would spin. And then the next version of the iPod, they finally went to um, solid state memory. But I thought it was very interesting, um, and I wish I would have kept it, the original one that had the, the moving part inside of it. But you know, at the time, you, you look at it and you're like, wow, this is such a piece of junk with so much better stuff. Um, you just throw it away. But now I, I bet you could you know, get like antique money for it. Definitely, <laughs> most definitely. Um, yeah, this was I mean, a smaller version of that, though. The yeah, this iPod. is the Nano. I, I remember the, the first one. I think my brother had it. It looked like a brick. It was pretty heavy, too. <laughs> yes, it was heavy. And you could actually, if you held it on, held, held it tightly and loaded a song, you could feel it moving internally. <laughs> the vibration of the disc spinning? Yep. Yeah. And here they introduced the iPod Nano. You know what's interesting about these, you know, these um, iPods is that they, they, they kind of reinvented the user interface. You know, the interaction with, you know, from like you take the the Sony Walkman or the the, the Panasonic cassette tape player. You know, they've com they completely like went away from that common interface or you know interaction with the human. And it's like, no, no, we're going to go a completely different way. And they came up with this little circle and dial that you can go and press the sides, press the top, press the bottom, or spin your thumb around the circle to do certain things, fast forward a song, yep. increase mm -hmm. the volume, stuff like that, you know? Well, there's also quality. Like they got rid of, you know, you had a CD player, you had skipping issues. Yep. Um, which when they went to solid state, that was that wasn't even an issue anymore. Like, and you know, trying to burn something to a CD to get your songs just right, um, that was a huge pain. It was. I, I don't ever want to relive those days. That was dark ages. Now, <clears throat> these um these nanos or these iPods. The one with the hard drive, were you able to go out jogging with it? Was it stable enough that you can go out jogging? You or? Could, yeah, it was, it was still pretty good. It wasn't as bad as a, a CD player. Um, they engineered it in such a way that outside motion, you couldn't really trip it up. Unless you banged it against the table, um, it wasn't the same as a CD spinning. Um, a hard drive spinner is much more stable and robust. And then that whole, even banging against the table, these iPod nanos that have flash storage, that went away completely. So now you could drop it and you wouldn't skip a beat on a song. Yep. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And I'm shocked that um, I, I see new cars now. They stopped putting CD players in new cars, which um, I have a, a Toyota Sienna 2015. It still has a CD player. I was like, why? Like, I feel like the automotive industry is very slow to adopt new technologies. And so you'll find some cars in 2010 and 2011 model years still having cassette players. Yeah. Because they're like, well, what if that's the one thing that drives the sale? We better just keep it just in case. Yep. Yeah. Um, and I'm glad we finally got to the point where they got rid of those things because, um, 
seriously, CD players in a car, it's just the worst thing ever. <laughs> um, and they, they're finally getting to like Apple Music or Android Music in the cars. It's like, man, finally the automobiles are just getting with the times. And I actually wish when they, they built a car, don't, don't build in the touch screen and all that. Just let us take a, a tablet and just insert it there. That would be very cool because then you can choose between Android or Apple. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Yeah. And when, when you get a newer tablet, you don't have to change out the car. You just take the old one, and throw it away, put the new one in. This, by the way, is just an iPad mini. Um, speaking of, you know, Apple technologies. Yeah. Yeah. That would be cool. <laughs> The iPod, I remember even before Apple released the iPod, um, I'm trying to remember back when I was in college, I think they went around asking um, people in, in different high schools to submit ideas for for a new gadget, something that, that people would want to use. And I think that's how the iPod started because people, some people, students came up with the idea It'd be nice if we had a device that held our music songs and we could um, reorder them, rename them, move them around, take out songs we don't want, put songs we, we do like. And that became the iPod. I remember something like that in the late 90s. Interesting. Uh, going on. That's I'd be curious to know um, more about that. Yeah, yeah, that would be interesting. And initially, when I saw the iPods, I didn't think this was going to be successful. You thought um, the Zoom was going to take over the world? Even that, I thought, like, well, <laughs> who wants to carry music around with them? Like, we have CD players. But then... Um, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> you just finished bashing CD players. <laughs> that's, that's true. And, and it, it's the irony because, um, you know, I'm bashing it now because... <laughs> so, you know, some, something better came along, but at the time it was hard to see how something could replace something so familiar to you as a CD player. You knew how it worked. You knew how to, to burn a CD. Um, and to think that some little device can hold songs and like, no, that's, that can't possibly replace a CD player, but, but it did. And then yeah. over time it, it got adoption. It, it became better over time. Um, at some point, everyone had one. Um, and then Apple moved from that to the iPhone. Yep. And I was a big hater of the iPhone for the longest time. I was like, well, Android is open source. Um, it has all these different companies making Android phones. Um, but then when I, um, uh, like not even a couple of years ago, when I jumped to the iPhone, <laughs> I have all Apple products now. Um, I can never go back to Android. Like Apple, um, the quality of Apple is is one of their strong points. Yep. Yeah. No. That's not to say I'll ever use a Mac because I do, you know, a lot of Windows heavy development. But if it wasn't for that, maybe I would have a Mac. You know, you could still do um, Windows development on Mac through virtualization. Yeah, so some people do that, and it's they they kind of struggle with it. Oh, I don't. It's almost there, but I think when we get to .NET six or .NET seven, it's, at some point it's going to be seamless. Yeah. yeah. Right now, it's still kind of um, not quite there yet. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. All right. Next up, we have September eighth, the I. R I A A sues a twelve-year-old. Yeah, you remember this, John? Um, Sam. Recording this industry music. Yeah, I remember that. I think, I think that that was back. You know, uh, back when there was a website called Kazaa, where you could download free music. Yes, it was around that time. Yeah. And yes. They're trying to crack down on um, uh, music pirating for crying wow. out loud. Like, 
Nowadays, you can get any music you want on YouTube. You don't even have to pay for it. You and can, back then, they were cranking down wanna, so much. If you want to own the, the the MP3, you can just go to Google and look for it. Yeah. It's it's quite silly, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's as silly as those FBI warnings on uh, VHS tapes. <laughs> I mean, FBI warnings on VHS tapes? You remember those, right? Yeah, they uh, like you. You'll go to Blockbuster, rent a movie on a VHS tape, and at the beginning, we show an FBI warning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I understand that why they're trying to do this. It's they're, you know, pirating bleeds an industry, um, and everyone suffers. But from my perspective, when you know, okay, it hurts the musician, but when your favorite musician dies of a drug overdose, well, maybe they didn't need all that money to buy the drugs for the overdose. <laughs> Just saying. What else do we got, Jonathan? Next up, we have September 10th, the first search engine. Whoa. Was it um, Archie? Oh, I don't remember Archie. Oh, oh that's... That's way back. That was before the LA riots. LA riots. <laughs> Are you talking about the Don, Rodney King LA riots? Yes. <clears throat> Archie. Wow. Do you, do you, um, were you aware of how these search engines worked? I actually learned about it in college um through a course um it was called uh web crawling yes and it would just um the early search engines what they would do is they would load a page find all the urls load those pages and eventually they would have to store all and categorize all of that data yes and google had um uh, a very efficient way of doing it and they eventually took over the whole market because they were they were able to actually store um tons of search data um uh surpassing like the other players in the day was infoseek lycos alta vista alta vista there's a, even another search engine called hasta la vista i don't remember that was about i don't i don't remember that one <laughs> but but what's interesting is that nowadays you can't have a a spider without it being able to process JavaScript. Because otherwise, any, any website that's written with React, Angular, Vue, um, you know, anything like that, you won't be able to see what comes up because the actual JavaScript renders a page on the client. Yep. So this, these, these spiders work well because back then, everything was HTML. And you yes. can follow the you can follow the anchor tags and and link pages and, and stuff like that. But nowadays, I don't I don't know how Google does it other than you know launching a Chrome browser on some machine to go and and surf the internet and, and index pages that way. They they're still able to do it. Um, and what happens is because those pages take uh, a little bit longer to load. They get a lower ranking in the in the search engines. So for for SEO purposes, um, you have people who are trying to do Angular. Um, what is it? Not just in time compiling, but ahead of time compiling. Mm -hmm. to try to get as much markup rendered as possible, so they can get ranked higher in the SEO uh, rankings. Mm. Um, but I, I do believe that Google still renders the JavaScript. And everything needed for the page, um, it just um, it adversely affects your page's ranking. Interesting. That's that's pretty interesting the way the way those search engines are working nowadays. Can you imagine? Well, 1990. So when did JavaScript come out? 1993. Oh uh, no, it was it was later. I think 90... 95. 95, 96. Yeah, yeah, 95, 96, yeah. Where it kind of just broke away from Java and... Yeah, yeah. Cool. What else we got, Jonathan? 
All right, next up. Oh, we no, have... notice that the end of that URL is .pl. What is that, Perl? Oh. Do you think this was written in Perl by any chance? Perl using CGI? That could be. Uh, CGI, Jonathan, stands for Common Gateway Interface, which is what a web server would be today. Hmm. But they didn't have all the plugins to be able to process like all the different languages. So you can have a web server, which is would be equivalent to basic CGI or a common gateway interface. And you can have what they call um, ISAPI filters and you can process an ASP.NET page or like a, a web API page, or you can process um, Django, which is written in Python, or you can process um, PHP, uh, which a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, WordPress sites uh, use. And so these ISAPI filters work along with the CGI or the, the common gateway interface to be able to process all these different um, languages that run on the server itself. Is, is that, that sound about right, Sam? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's how I understand it. I, I won't pretend to know the exact details of how these ISAPI filters work, but that's, that's kind of what, maybe that PL stands for Perl, and it probably ran, um, it probably ran as a common gateway interface, but it doesn't say here. I don't see anything here. And Perl was a scripting language that um, could allow you to use uh, low level pointers, um, but it was notoriously difficult to read and maintain. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't say anything about it here. So, cool. All right. Hey, Rick, is, it, is it your understanding uh, PHP that stood for a personal homepage? Personal homepage? No, it was a it for me PHP. The story that I heard was that it was a a pre hypertext processor. Oh, gotcha! I've been telling people personal homepage. <laughs> That, you know, it probably had a double meaning. I mean, that makes sense because PHP with WordPress, you could, anybody can spin up a, um, a personal homepage with, uh, with WordPress running on PHP, but it was, it's my understanding that PHP stands for pre hypertext processor. Interesting. Yeah. Because you, you do the scripting and it joins the programming the PHP programming with your hypertext and then it renders HTML. Wow. So. <laughs> Still used today. Still, 78% of the web is powered by PHP. That's, wow. that's a scary thought. <laughs> but you know, you know what that means? Job security, because at some point they're going to want to convert those. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next. Cool. Last one is September 12th, first test of an integrated circuit. The first test of an integrated circuit. 1958. What is, what is considered an integrated circuit? What does that mean? Again, that's, that's, too much electrical engineering for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's in the first course about electrical engineering you take, you learn what that is, but that's over my head. <laughs> that's beyond my pay grade, huh? <laughs> so Jack Kilby demonstrates the first integrated circuit to other researchers and, and executives at Texas Instrument. It's 1958. I kind of feel like we have um, similar things today, um, like a parallel to this, like with um, quantum computers. It seems like each day they discover something new with quantum computers that will one day make, you know, quantum computers in every household. So an integrated circuit or monolithic integrated circuit referred to as IC, a chip or a microchip, 
set of electronic circuits with one small flat piece or a chip of semiconductor material, usually silicon, large number of tiny MOSFET or metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistors integrated into a small chip. The result in circuits that are orders of magnitude smaller, faster, less expensive than those constructed of discrete electronic components. The IC's mass production capability, reliability, and building block approach to integrated circuit design has ensured the rapid adoption of standardized ICs in place of inextricable, I don't even think I pronounced that word correctly, inextricable parts of the structure of modern societies made possible by a small piece, low cost of ICs, such as the modern computer processor. So a, so a, a processor is considered so like say the i9 processor is considered, it's considered a, an IC or a chip or a yeah. microprocessor, microchip. Interesting. I guess this was the start of that. Yeah, yeah, this was the beginning of all that. Whoa. Which looks a little clunky. Yeah, that's, I don't know who did the soldering there, but. Can you imagine <clears throat> going to the executives at Texas Instrument and showing them this, what looks like, I mean, no insult, but a piece of junk <laughs> and saying, <laughs> we can make millions of dollars off of this. <laughs> and the executives were like, yeah, show us, <laughs> enlighten us. We don't get it. <laughs> cool. All right. Yeah, that's, that's all we have this week in tech history. Sweet. All right. Well, until next time, thanks for joining us, Sam. Oh, thank you for having me. Peace. Later, gents. <laughs> <laughs>